Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Okay, walking with the limp is the idea is that we have to come face to face with this tension that we all struggle with, that we all contend with. Who we are and who God says we were meant to be. Who we are, really, we have this thing at the staff that says, hey, how are you, how are you doing? You know, the, 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 the normal things like, oh, we're doing good. No, but how are you doing? Whenever we had the word really, how are you doing really? It's like, it's an open invitation to just, Bleh. okay? Who are you, really? Who you are and who God is meant for you to be. And it's the story of Jacob. This whole series was, is, is rallying around the story of Jacob in Genesis. And so Jacob was deceiver. He identified with his name, and it means deceiver, grabbing at the heels, always trying to get ahead. But God saw him as Israel, the one that God would fight and prevail. In his life, Jacob was always trying to fight and manipulate his way to get God's blessings. And he, and he stole his birthright, uh, his brother's birthright and his blessings. But then he had a wrestling match that we talked about last week, and God prevailed. He goes, you can either keep doing it your way, or you can let me fight for you, and I'll give you your blessings. And so it's that tension that we have. And the more we understand that we are Israel in God's eyes, the less we'll be acting like Jacob. Amen. It's a new identity that he's given to him. It's, it's, it's a new identity that we have to identify with uh, rather than live out of our old man, our old creature, our old nature, right? It says, in your flesh dwells no good thing, but you're no longer in your flesh. You've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in him. Come on, you got there? And so it's identifying with that idea. Walking with the limp is understanding that with one foot, when we're walking, it reminds us of our humanity. And if you're not careful, that's all you'll focus on. As Doug was talking about, just all the stuff you can't do that you're weak at. But where there's another foot. And with the other foot, it needs to remind you of your identity. One's your humanity. The other one is your new identity that God has given to you because of what Jesus did uh, through redemption. Amen? Are you out there? So every single one of us, we have blind spots. Every single one of us, we have weaknesses. We have stuff that we contend with. Walking with a limb is not bad. It's healthy only if you allow his strength in this new identity to help you overcome your weaknesses. And he can do that. He'll do that consistently. You can't deny, you can't, you can't deny that you're weak in certain areas. You can't deny that there's certain appetites that you gravitate towards. Don't deny them, recognize them, but then allow the spirit of God to redirect them so that your weaknesses become actually his strength. And that's kind of what we're looking at today. So the story this morning that we're looking at is, it's actually in your notes there, but it centers around the idea of appetites and birthrights. Can you say that with me? Appetites and birthrights. And here's why it's important for us to pay attention. One, you all have appetites. And you all have a birthright. For those of us who followed Christ, have crossed over the line of faith, we also have a birthright, right? Your birthrights should always be more valued than your appetites. As a matter of fact, if you focus more on the birthrights, it'll empower you to overcome all the other stuff. Amen. Amen. By the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your body. Walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of Amen. the flesh. Amen. Identify more with what He's given you rather than that you're trying to earn or grab or you know manipulate to get. Does that make sense? Yes, birthright. Appetites. You have a birthright, you have favor with God and with man. Right. The appetite is when God promotes me. I'm going to begin to leverage it for my selfish reasons. Birthright, you have a new identity in Christ. Your worth is based upon the work that Jesus did, but your appetite is that you're trying to increase your self-worth by self-effort. There's appetites we have to contend with. Does that make sense? Let's take a look at appetites and birthrights. Genesis, the 25th chapter, verses 24 through 34, it says this. And when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did, did indeed have twins, Anybody a twin here? Just curious. Really? Oh, wow, there's a couple of you guys. It's amazing. Do you love your brothers or sister? Good. One of them went like that, the other one was like, no. The first one was very red at birth. Hey, you are a twin. Are you serious? You are red. You are Esau. 
The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. So they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heels. So they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. I love that. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. He was a homeboy, just a homebody. It wasn't, it wasn't that he was a mama's boy, even though I said that last week. It's that he valued faith, he, his faith. He valued family. He invalued, it's almost like the, who's the lady that just passed away? Queen. The queen. Yes, I forgot. It's those two guys. One of them, anyways, I need to just stop. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating with wild game. Esau brought home, but Rebekah loved Jacob. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. Give me some of that mole. Maybe it was menu. I don't know what it was, but he was hungry. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Don't ever despise your birthrights. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me right now? Well, maybe you don't need it right now, but you understand that you're going to need it later. And the immediate is crying out right now because I have uncontrolled appetites. But little am I going to know that if I give in to the immediate gratification of the moment, I'm going to forfeit something in the future. How many guys have done that? Who does that? Who forfeits their birthright for, for a bowl of stew? We do. I do. I've done. Does make sense? <clears throat> Jacob said, first you have to swear that your birthright is mine. Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all of his rights as the firstborn to his brother, Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. That's like bean soup, okay? That's why I called it Jacob's lentil. The title of it is Jacob's lentil soup. It's like bean soup. And what happens after you eat bean soup? You eat the meal, then you get up and leave. This showed how Esau despised his rights as a firstborn. Isn't that good? <clears throat> appetites. Let me define appetites real quick. Appetites is a strong desire, a longing, passions of the body or the mind. These are tendencies that we have. I have, if I'm not careful, I have addictive behavior. I can get addicted to anything. Well, that's why I was addicted to drugs. And it's a rejection button. And the reason I can get addicted to anything is because that drug would never reject me. That food never, water burger never rejects me. (laughs) That stuff never rejects me. Make sense? If I'm not careful, work, or anything. If I'm not careful, Natalie has to keep me in check constantly. Some of you brothers, you have to keep me in check constantly. It's like, hey, you're probably leaning over in this area of your life. Your pastor, online, has addictive personality, addictive behavior. And if I'm not careful, I will lean towards that, and that will be the thing that will be my worst enemy. So always, hey, you don't have to say anything, just know that, okay? So long, it's a passion of the body tendency. All appetites have only two words in their vocabulary, more and now. More, it's never, it's never enough. Appetites are never fully satisfied. Never. It's like the grave. It's never satisfied. It'll do it on 9-11. It'll do it on whatever holiday. It's never satisfied. It always has those two words in its vocabulary, more and now. So that's uh, appetites. Let's talk about birthrights. Birthrights, they are certain privileges that we have. Do I have that on there? Because of God's grace rather than human effort. It's grace that God's given to us. These are birthrights that he's given to us, not because of what we've done, but because of who he is. Okay? Uh, Galatians, the third chapter says, if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring. You're heirs according to his promise. I love this passage in Romans, the fifth chapter. It says, through one man's effect, death reigned through the one, and more those who receive the abundance of grace. You receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. You're right standing with God, not because of what you do, but because of what he did, right? And then, because of that, we will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. You know, I love the idea that, of that song. I used to didn't like that song it's where it says, he gives and he takes away. 
Remember that song? It's like, man, that's an ungodly, horrible song. Like, he's not taking away anything. You know, he's always giving me stuff. And I realized, like, wait a minute. So that's not true. He does give away. He gives and he takes away. He gives us freedom. He gives us peace. He gives us acceptance. He gives us, man, everything that we need that we didn't have. He gives us, he gives us a new identity. And he takes away our shame. He takes away our guilt. He takes away our ugliness on the inside. He takes away our old identity. And he gives us something new to live for. Amen. But at times, I don't know about you, the voice of our flesh, the voice of our emotions are a whole lot low, louder than the voice of God's spirit. Yes, sir. And so you buy into like, man, you're just a failure. Yeah. You're weak. You're a sorry dad. You're a horrible. You're a distant husband. You're a proud pastor. And if I'm not careful, I'll buy into those lies. And even though I might be acting out in some of those areas, what I do and who I am are two different things. I don't know if you get that or not. <clears throat> I used to tell my grandson, it's like, hey, listen. He would always say, man, I'm stupid. And Hayden's back. Hayden's in the back. Hayden, if you're in the back, love you. He was like, man, I'm so stupid. He would do something, and it, would, it might have been a disappointment or whatever, and I'd have to stop him. Why? Because... That's not who he is. That might have been what he did. I said, son, listen, the stuff that you did might have disappointed me, but you're not a disappointment. Amen. Understand that. Yeah. And so that's how God is constantly, he's, that's how he's discipling me. This is, might be stuff that you're contending with, that you've been contending with all your life, but what you've done, what you've leaned into, what you've you know, allowed to happen, that's not who you are. I've given you a new birthright. I've given you a new identity. It's Natalie, one of the greatest days of my life was when Natalie uh, said yes to me and I married her or she married me or however it worked. <laughs> when she married me, she took on my name. Even though later she added Natalie Longoria Avalos. <laughs> just to make sure if I didn't make it. <laughs> She'd still have her name. And I get it. I get it. But we became one. All that I had is hers which is not much, and all that she had is ours. Together, we have these things together, right? Yes, 38 years. That's a long time. Together, 40-something years. I just can't believe she's still here with me. And I told her, I said, if you leave, I'm following you. Wherever you go, I'm following you. And I believe that. <clears throat> Anyways, what's my point? My point is something. There is a thing that, you know, the Ten Commandments says, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Right? right? Yes, sir. A lot of times we think that that basically means when a car is cutting you off, Jesus Christ, you know, that's taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Hebrew thought of that is not, is not about how you use his name. The Hebrew thought behind that is, that, is, is this idea. Is your life in alignment with how, are you reflecting who he is? Are you reflecting his name? Are you reflecting his identity? Not just behavior-wise, but more than anything, self-talk. Man, I'm just so stupid. Man, I'm weak. I'm never going to be that leader. Because, man, that's just, I'm just so dumb. He goes, really? And the Spirit of God will say, really? Because you're dumb? I'm smart. Hallelujah. I have wisdom. Hallelujah. And you're in me and I'm in you. Hallelujah. You have wisdom too. Hallelujah. Make sense? Yes, sir. That's, we can't, so, much, so often we're taking the name of the Lord in vain, just through our self-talk. And man, I don't know about you, but man, God's constantly, he's been all of my life, he's been coaching me. It, it went so extreme that I had a man come from Australia. Some of you guys remember, might have been here, his name is Peter Daniels. He came in here, multi-millionaire, has his own money, blah, 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 whatever. I don't know who this guy is, but somebody told him about me in Dallas. Mr. Avalos, Pastor Avalos, I heard about you. He was like, who are you? Because some pastor in Dallas told me about you. I'm going to come and I want to speak to all your businessmen at work. It's like, I don't know who you are. Are you sure you got the right church? I'm looking him up online. It's like Peter Daniels, Peter Daniels. You can Google him right now. The dude was speaking to 20s, 30s, 50, 100,000 people. I'm like, are you sure you got the right guy? Because I got a little church here, about a couple hundred people. I know who you are because I'm coming over. You don't have to pay for anything. Uh, I'm going to come and speak to your businessmen. So he came, long story short. It was the first time. He was probably, how old was he was he been? He was in his 70s then. He's 80-something now. I think he's still alive. I'm not sure. Look him up. Google him. Tell me about it afterwards. 
It was the first time he came into this church. He's always been a suit and tie guy, his wife told us. It's the first time he felt so relaxed and so, because of the environment, so real, that he came in just his slacks and his shoes and a no tie shirt, short sleeve shirt. And I thought that was normal because that's how we dressed. But the wife said, he goes, no, that is, that's the first time I've ever seen him do that. I'm like, wow. So he preaches. He All weekend long, he takes off. He's about to go back to Australia. I get a call, and I get an invitation, Natalie and I do. He invites us to this place up in Minnesota. Was it Minnesota? Chicago. Chicago. And it's a, a, a unique, uh, just a, a few folks that he invited. And I'm thinking, that's how God's going to provide for us. He's going to give me a million dollars, I'm thinking in my head. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not lying. I'm like, this is how, this is how it's going to happen. He loves me. He likes me. He's going to invite me to this thing. So we fly up there. And I'm like, I'm believing God. I'm trusting God. I was like, yeah, thank you, Lord. And we walked in there, and it was a, a unique place. It was a place, I can't even remember. It's probably a church, I think. And we walk in there. We had our little car that we, were, that we rented out or leased out. And we walked into this place. Man, they had all these freaking crazy, amazing cars, like the, all these top high-dollar cars, Lexuses and $100,000 cars. We come in our little lease car, little Focus or whatever it is. <laughs> and we walk in, and there's people, you know, it's not a bunch of people, it's half of this room, just a little place. And we're meeting so-and-so, and he's like, who are you? It's like, oh, my name's Marcus. And he goes, oh, okay, well, I'm so-and-so. I'm a multi-billionaire business in Mexico. I mean, these people were all over the world, literally all over the world, multi-millionaires, entrepreneurs, and I'm shrinking. Every time I introduce myself to someone else, I'm like shrinking inside. I'm like, what the heck am I doing here? Who are you? I'm a pastor about a couple hundred people in Seguin, Texas. And the Lord spoke to me. He goes, how are you feeling? It's like, very uncomfortable, sir. I'm very uncomfortable. He goes, just stay here. I got a lesson for you. Is it a lesson or is it a million dollars? What is it? Everybody's waiting for Peter Daniels to come in. Peter Daniels walks through the doors just like that man walked through the door. He sees me. We make eye to eye. He moves everybody out of the way. He comes straight to me and just gives me a big old hug. And people are looking at me like, who are you, dude? <laughs> Kenneth Copeland was there. All these just people from all over the world. I went home, didn't get a million dollars. I had nothing. But I got something that I'll never forget. He branded something inside of me. He said, Marcus? He goes, son, he goes, you don't see yourself like I see you. Because you don't feel like you belong in a place like this. Do you guys like, no, sir? He goes, I see you just as valuable as any of these men's worth. Because you're more worth. You have more worth than that. Don't you ever forget that lesson. I said, you brought me all the way up there to Chicago <laughs> just to teach me that. You've been trying to teach me that from day one. Help me identify with my new identity rather than this old behavior pattern, this old thinking, stinking thinking that I had, that it's just a mindset. Make sense? <clears throat> Sometimes it's so loud. <laughs> There's a psalm in Psalms 139. So I begin to think different about myself, speak different about myself. Embrace the truth of who God says I am. That's my new identity. I do have appetites, and I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm not, you know, I'm a perfect person. No, I have this stuff, but this is who I am. Amen. 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 And the more I focus on that, the less I live like Jacob. The less I, the, the, the empowerment I get to overcome and walk in Him in that place. Amen. Some of you guys may feel like, man, I'm just, I'm rejected. I'm not accepted. I'm this low. I'm just, man, I'm just constantly struggling. Let me tell you. God knows you where you're at right now. Right. He knows where you were back then, yes, but he also knows where you are in the future. Amen. And it doesn't change his mind. You can't do anything more to love him, to allow him to love you like you are. You can't do anything less yes, right. to experience the love that he has for you right now. Amen. Some of you guys just need this one passage. This just came up right before we got here in the service. So this is for somebody here. Amen. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame your frame was never hidden from him. When you were being made in secret, maybe you thought you were an aborted child. You are going to be an aborted person. Maybe you thought that you were just neglected because, man, your dad and your mom left you. And you were abandoned and you were, you know, whatever, adopted. He knew you 
when you were being made in secret, intricately woven you in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was not even one of them or none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they would be more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. You have a new identity. You take on his name. That's who you are. Amen. That's not, that might not be how, how you feel, but that's who you are. Are you serious? Is it 10 o'clock already? Love you. Appreciate you. He says, hey, pastor, when do I come up? 10 o'clock. And I see him. He's like, really? I might have to make this a two-parter. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Everyone in this story that we talked about has appetites. Rebecca has appetites to put her son first. And she yielded to those appetites. She betrayed her husband. She betrayed her oldest son. Jacob, of course, we saw last week that he had appetites that he yielded himself to. His biggest appetite was self-preservation. He was just trying to do stuff. You know, he wasn't allowed. God wanted to bless him. God fought for him so that he could be blessed. But he tried to manipulate his way into the blessing. But Esau, notice what it says in verse 27 about Esau. As the boys grew, Esau became a very skillful hunter. Esau had an appetite for developing his craft. How many guys, I mean, I love musicians, but man, they, the time that they take, Levi, these guys that are up here, I'm like, man, I'm blown away. They have to take the time to get to that level of expertise, that level of, of just expressing their worship to the Father, right? Esau was skilled at, at hunting. He had an appetite to develop that craft. Is there anything wrong with that? No. But you can't allow that craft to override your character. Esau was really strong in craft, but he was weak in character. Esau was really good at killing dinner, but he was never good at controlling his appetite. And you see that in that story. Some of us, we're, we can get so involved in working on our skill set and not involved in walking in our inheritance and eventually we'll despise what matters most. Amen. We're not careful. You know, you can develop skillfully, but skillfully developed person is not a sign of being spiritually developed. You can be skillfully sound and spiritually stupid. Tweet that thing. Put it on a bumper sticker. Tattoo it. <laughs> Proverbs 25 says, like a city that is broken in without walls, it's a weak city, is a man who has no control over his temperament, over control over his character, no control over his appetites. Now, if you notice a little bit, verse down in verse 29, notice that Esau, it says that he was empty. He was his, his emptiness. He arrived from home in the wilderness exhausted, and he was hungry. He was empty. And if your life is empty, you'll feed on anything. Isn't that the truth? Yes, sir. If it's empty, be aware of the of the what you're what's starving inside of you. If your life is empty, you'll feed on anything. You have to fill yourself with God's identity not your human deficiency. A few years ago, Natalie and I went skiing. It, kind of, it might have been the first time we went skiing. And, man, I was so sore on the way back home. I was like, man, I've used muscles I never used before. So day two comes around. It's like, hey, you guys go skiing. I'm going to stay home. I'm going to make some 15 bean soup. And I did. And, man, I made that soup, and I threw whatever was in that cabin inside of that pot. And it was bad. It was bad. <laughs> I ate a little bit of it. I was like, I'm going to save it for them to come back. Because <laughs> if it was anything like yesterday, they're going to be hungry. <laughs> they came back home. I put. I, I made y'all some soup. Man, they tore that sucker up. They tore that soup up. They ate all of it. Why? Because they were hungry. And you and I will eat anything if we're hungry. You know what happened next in our story? They ate quickly and left the room. Restroom break. And we give in to our appetites. It'll always end up in the same way. It'll be a very bad moment and you'll be reeking bad. It'll not be a good thing for our lives. So ladies, you don't need to look for love in a club. You don't need to look for love in a office space at lunchtime with that man or that woman or whatever it is. What you're actually looking for is the love that comes from Christ himself. Amen. Amen. All of us have appetites that if we're not careful, we'll yield to them and it'll put us in places that we have no right being. 
Our satisfaction in God comes from our birthright, not from our appetites. We have to make sure that we hold on to that new identity in him. Esau filled his immediate need, but he forfeited his future birthright. Ecclesiastes, the sixth chapter, it says, all the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetites is never filled. What was the appetite? When you think about the hunger status of Jesus, Jesus said, my will, my appetite is to fulfill my Father's will, is to do the will of my Father, amen, Amen. of him who sent me and to finish that work. Hunger pains make us do some crazy things, don't they? I don't know about you, but whenever I go to pack and pack, pack and pack, pick and pack or sack pack and Man, those things that are right there when you're paying, <laughs> Twinkies, all that stuff is like, that can really do some damage, not only to your pocketbook, but to your waist. Yes, sir. He has a great shape. I have a shape. Okay? <laughs> you're not careful. You know, unsettled emotions, and I'm thinking about this, though. I had to write this down. Unsettled emotions will cause one to compromise. Hunger in this area of your life will cause you to compromise. Have you ever heard anybody say, man, she she left her husband for him? That dude had a six pack. This dude's got a keg. What's, what happened? Or he left his wife for her? Doesn't he, you know, he know who that is? Why does that happen? Somebody was hungry. Somebody was hungry. We'll eat anything out of a bowl. If you're hungry, amen. Our Bible, our, our Raymond Bible Training Center, we had a class called Family Life. Am I taking too long? The Cowboys don't play till tonight, okay? Um, they had a class called Family Life. They had a really great idea. They said, hey, pastors, and when I went to pastor school, pastor's class, and they had a, um, a lesson. It says, whenever you become a pastor, just make sure that in your office, you get a big old couch. And we're like, that's weird. Why? Why is that? Because you can't let your husband get too hungry. I don't know if you know what that means or not. So never, Natalie never lets me get too hungry for anything else but her. Because there's always opportunities. There's always stuff that can happen. If you're not careful, you're a target. It's not that I'm beautiful. It's that people are attracted to power. People are attracted to stuff that they think they don't have, but they want. Why? And they're unsatisfied appetites. If you're not careful, you become emotionally hungry, you're going to give in to those appetites, and you'll start saying yes to this little lunch in the office with that gal or with that guy, and it just goes on from there. Next thing you know, you bit the whole thing. And you forfeited your two-year-old son for someone you don't even know. Make sense? I'm just trying to pass you. Is that okay? Great. Shortcuts. Another way to see it. Esau traded his inheritance in. Adam gave in and gave his inheritance away. The prodigal son spent his inheritance. Moses forfeited his inheritance. Jesus was tempted by the devil to take a shortcut so he could give away his inheritance, but he didn't do that. That's right. He fought, he remained steady, he remained steadfast. His, his hunger was to fulfill God's will, to fill the Father's work and to finish that work. Here's my admonition to you. Here's the last passage of scripture. Write this down or take a picture of it. My admonition to you as a pastor is that this, Proverbs 23rd chapter. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, someone influential, someone who has what you don't have but you want, put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to great appetite. Watch your Appetites. How am I going to land this plane? I'm not sure yet, but here is what I can tell you. Here's your take home. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit there and just ask the question. The question is, what's in your bowl? Follow-up questions. What's the thing being held out to you right now that you're finding difficult to say no to? What are you talking yourself into? What are you contemplating that your spouse is uncomfortable with? What are you doing that's not legal or immoral, but you hope nobody ever finds out about it? What are you being tempted with that will give up your future for something temporary? What's in your bowl? If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. 
or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.